I'm Francis Hellman, Chair of the Physics Department, and I'd like to welcome you all to this year's Oppenheimer Lecture, and I'm going to turn the podium over to Professor Marvin Cohen, who's going to do the rest of the introductions. All right. Welcome to the 2009 J. Robert Oppenheimer Lecture. It's been a great pleasure for me to serve on the Oppenheimer Lecture Committee since its inception in 1998. We've been privileged to have several of the world's outstanding physicists deliver lectures to us in this series. Murray Gelman, Kip Thorne, Freeman Dyson, uh, Qingying Yang, Robert Laughlin, Bruno Zumino, Edward Witten, Martin Rees, Michael Fisher, Stephen Hawking, David Merman, and today our 12th lecturer is Claude Cohn Tanuji. In the early lectures, before introducing the speaker, I would say something about Oppenheimer and the history of his involvement with our department. However, in recent years, I say less because of the wide range of media coverage and our own department displays covering his activities in Berkeley from 1929 to 1943. His former office is room 435 in Old Lacan Hall, where he smoked incessantly. And there are histories and letters, a plaque, and a number of memorabilia on the fourth floor of Olacan Hall, which I invite you to visit. For those of you who would like to learn even more about Oppenheimer, there is considerable information on the web, and it seems like new books about him come out every year. The opera Dr. Atomic, which had its premiere in San Francisco in 2005, was recently performed at the Metropolitan Opera in New York, and there have been at least two television dramas and documentaries about Oppenheimer in the last several months. So his legend lives on, and we continue to celebrate Berkeley, his Berkeley connection. This evening, we will hear about quantum phenomena and learn again that matter can be particle-like and wave-like. It is said that Einstein spent more time thinking and worrying about quantum theory than about relativity. Quantum theory is uh, and quantum phenomena are sometimes referred to as being spooky, unusual. And some scientists have said that no one really understands quantum mechanics. In fact, one of my most embarrassing academic moments uh, concerns quantum mechanics, and it happened over 40 years ago, when I was walking across campus with our late colleague, Professor Emilio Segre. I was a new assistant professor, and I was still having trouble calling him by his first name. I had been an undergraduate here, and I sat in part of his quantum mechanics course. And so at that time, I still regarded him as a senior professor and certainly not as a, a colleague. And he could be quite formal at times. Uh, we were discussing physics, and Segre asked me to redo a calculation on mesons and solids that Enrico Fermi and Edward Teller had originally done in 1947. And I greatly enjoyed the opportunity to talk to him. And I loved hearing Segre's stories about his mentor, Fermi, who was and still is one of my very top heroes. Anyway, at some point in the conversation, and for no good reason whatsoever, I blurted out the statement, Quantum mechanics is the greatest intellectual achievement of mankind. I was young. And I expected Segre to agree. You know, he taught quantum mechanics and so forth. He turned to me with a scornful look on his face and he said, and what about classical mechanics? <laughs> and I shyly said that classical, classical mechanics was more obvious and dealt with things we see every day. He then got even more upset. And he said, oh, it's obvious that if you push an object, it will continue to move forever. And what about light and heavy objects falling at the same rate off the Tower of Pisa? That was obvious. I knew he would get to an Italian at some point. <laughs> he then went on to give me a detailed history lesson about Galileo and even Newton. And fortunately, I, got, I was quiet and listened. Well, to be honest and with due respect, to Emilio, who over the years became a very good friend, a very close friend, I still feel that quantum theory is amazing and that it is at least one of the greatest intellectual achievements of, man, of humankind. And like many scientists, I am happy 
to have had the good fortune to have spent most of my adult life trying to understand and applying quantum theory. Our 2009 Oppenheimer lecturer, Claude Cohn-Tanuji, understands quantum mechanics at the deepest levels. He has written a classic two-volume text that is the standard throughout the world for students trying to learn the subject. And his research has given new insights into the quantum nature of matter. Because of his texts and lectures, he has educated a generation of scientists worldwide in this area of modern physics. Claude Cohn-Tanuji was born in Algeria. And after primary and secondary studies there, he left for Paris in 1953 to attend the École Normale Supérieure, where he listened to lectures given by Henri Cartan, Laurent Schwartz, and Alfred Kessler. Alfred Kessler. And I learned today that he also shared an office with our own Charles Towns during that period, who was visiting on sabbatical. He received his PhD in 1962 from that institution, working with Kassler and Jean Brossel. He later taught at the University of Paris, and in 1973, he became a professor at the Collège de France, where he, which is a wonderful institution dating back to the year 1530. At the Collège de France, Claude formed a laboratory to study laser cooling and trapping of atoms to allow detailed studies of their properties. This research was the basis for his award of the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1997, which he shared with William Phillips and our own Stephen Chu, who is currently on loan to President Obama as Secretary of Energy. These marvelous studies led to many more discoveries and more Nobel Prizes and the lowest man-made temperatures, I believe. I should mention that Claude is the first Oppenheimer lecturer who has done both experimental and theoretical physics. The others have all been theorists. So I think we will hear a broad description of his topic from both points of view. Claude wrote in his autobiography that he was brought up to respect studying, learning, and sharing knowledge with others. I believe that this evening we will see examples of these virtues in his lecture on quantum and, quantum and degenerate gases, quantum degenerate gases, achievements, and perspectives. Claude Contenigi. Thank you very much, Marvin, for your very kind introduction. And before starting, uh, let me tell you how happy I am to be here today in Berkeley and to have this opportunity to meet again so many colleagues, so many friends, so many professors. You, you mentioned that uh, I was uh, at Economan when uh, Charlie Towns spent uh, sabbatical in Paris, and I still remember the wonderful time we had together. You know, it's for me a very, very great honor to be invited to give the Oppenheimer lecture. When you mentioned the list of the previous speakers, it's very impressive and a very great honor to be invited to participate to this series of lectures. And I would like to express my warmest thanks to uh, Francis Hellman, to the Department of Physics, and to Marvin Cohen for inviting me to give this lecture. You know, I've, I will try to present to you this evening a broad view of what is going on on the field of ultra-cold quantum gases. You know, during the last few decades, there has been uh, spectacular advances in our ability to manipulate atoms and to control all the degrees of freedom, like the polarization, the spin polarization by optical pumping, the velocity by laser cooling, by evaporative cooling, the position by, which means trapping, and which is fantastic now we can control also atom-atom interaction using the so-called Feshbach resonances. So what I would like to do in this lecture is first to briefly describe the basic methods uh, allowing one to control, to manipulate the atom, to, make, to give a state of the art in this domain, very briefly. Then I would like to discuss, to 
show you a few examples showing how ultra cold atoms are now allowing one to perform new, more refined tests of the basic law of physics and to achieve new situations where all parameters can be controlled, fully controlled, giving you the opportunity to build simple models for understanding more complex systems which are found in other fields of physics. That's the main goal of my lecture. So let me start with the first part, how to produce, how to manipulate ultra-cold atoms and molecules, first discussing what kind of forces we are using, how we cool atoms, how we trap them, and how we can control the interaction by Feshbach resonances. To explain how it's possible to exert forces on atoms, perhaps the best thing is to take a very simple example, which everybody can understand. Suppose that you have a target, C here, which is bombarded by a beam of particle, projectiles P, coming all from the same direction. The projectile bounces on the target and are reflected in all directions. And as a result of this bombardment, the target is pushed. In more sof sophisticated terms, you can say that you have a transfer of momentum from the projectile to the target and giving rise to a force. You can extend this simple picture to the case where C, the target, is an atom and where the projectiles are photons energy grain for light. The photons absorb, the atom absorbs the photon and remit it in all possible directions, so it is equivalent of the bombardment by particle, and as, re, as a result of this bombardment, the atom is pushed. So this is the origin of the force. And you know, we have example of this force, we know it for a long time. It is the tail of the comet. The comet is an astrophysical object surrounded by dust, and the light coming from the sun push uh, this uh, dust and gives rise to the tail of the comet. That don't, not the only effect, but it is part of the effect. And you see that the tail, <coughs> the tail of the comet is oriented along the direction of the sun, not along the tangent of the trajectory. What happens is that in a light beam, when the laser beam, the intensity is higher and the force can be huge. It can communicate to the atom an acceleration or a deceleration which is equal to 100,000 times the gravity of the acceleration. And let me uh, show you briefly how can this happen. You know, uh, you have absorption, spontaneous emission cycle of a photon by the atom, whose uh, time is determined by the lifetime of the excited state. The excited state of atoms does not live forever. After a certain time, capital tau, the atom falls to the ground state by emitting a photon. Tau is called the radiative lifetime, and an order of, rad of magnitude is 10 to the minus 8 seconds. It can vary from one atom to the other, from one state to the other. So if you have an atom in a laser beam, it can undergo a number of cycles, absorption emission, which is of the order of 1 over tau, which is 10 to the 8, 100 million cycles per second. During each of these cycles, the velocity of the atom changes because you have a transfer of momentum, the momentum of the photon is h nu over c, so the velocity, the recoil velocity of an atom absorbing a photon is h nu over mc, and when you put this number, you find that when an atom absorbs a photon, its recoil velocity is on the order of one centimeter per second, 10 to the minus two meter per second. That's a very small effect compared to the average velocity of an atom at room temperature, for example, it's about 300 meters per second. So, but this small effect can be repeated 10 to the 8 times per second. So the mean velocity change per second, which is what one is in physics is the acceleration or deceleration, is 10 to the 8, the velocity change per cycle, times the number of cycles per second. So it's 10 to the minus 2, 10 to the 8, 10 to the 6 meter per second square is 10 to the 5G. So it's a huge force. So with such a force, you can stop an atomic beam. If you have a beam of atoms coming in this direction with a velocity, let me say, uh, one kilometer per second, if you excite them by a laser beam which is uh, opposite direction, then the atoms can be stopped in one meter with this acceleration. And of course, uh, because of the Doppler effect, they, they get out of resonance and you have to add a magnetic field to compensate by a Zeeman effect the change of the 
apparent frequency of the laser due to the Doppler effect. That was invented by my colleague and friend, Bill Phillips and his colleagues here. And that's called uh, Zeeman's lower. In, in one meter, you can stop the atoms, and then they come back to the other. Now, when the atoms are stopped, they still have a velocity spread. And the velocity spread characterizes the temperature. And how can you reduce this velocity spread? It is the object of laser cooling, which was suggested, the method of laser doubler cooling was suggested by Ted Hans, Art Shallow, Dave Wineland, and Hans Demel and uh, some theory was done by these people. And the idea is very simple. Instead of taking a single beam, you take now two beams, two laser beams, counter-propagating, with the same frequency, with the same intensity, and with the same frequency, new laser slightly detuned below the atomic frequency, new atomic. If the atom is at rest, there is no Doppler effect, the two radiation pressure forces are equal and opposite, they cancel out. If the atom is moving to the right, as shown here, because of the Doppler effect, the apparent frequency of the counter-propagating beam will be shifted up. Since it is smaller than new A, it will get closer from new A. It will be more resonant, more photons will be absorbed, and the force will increase. The conclusion is reversed for the other beam. The Doppler shift is negative. The frequency will be shifted down farther from resonance, less absorption, less photon absorbed, and the force will decrease. So as a consequence of the Doppler effect, the two forces will no longer balance, and you will have a net force opposite to the velocity. And that, in physics, it is what is called viscosity. When you have a, a pot of honey, or when you try to move a spoon in a pot of honey, you get a resistance, and the higher the speed, the bigger the force. That's a viscous medium. This is why people, uh, the physicists, call this uh, scheme an optical molasses. It looks like a pot of honey, except that the light is replaced, it, the honey is replaced by light. And you have a picture here of a ball of called sodium atoms at the intersect of six laser beams, two along X, two along Y, and two along Z, which calls the three degrees of freedom. But a good surprise, which was observed in 1988, when you make the theory of this effect, you predict that the temperature would be, should be 200 microkelvin, which is already very, very nice. But when the measurement by time of flight techniques were performed, it appeared that the temperature was 100 times lower, 2 microkelvin. So this means that the Doppler cooling is not the only mechanism. Something else is happening. And we, with my young colleague, Jean Daliba, we identified this uh, mechanism. And Stephen Chu also made some work uh, called uh, polarization gradient cooling. And the idea is the following. There's atoms, the alkali atoms in the ground state have several demand sublevels. Let me take a simple case of a spin one half. Uh, state in the ground state. So you have two spin states, spin up and spin down. Now, because the two laser beams are coherent, they form a standing wave with maxima and new minima of intensity, antinodes and nodes. And in fact, you can show that when you have a non resonant light exciting an atom, you can show that the levels are shifted by light. And in fact, that was my PhD uh, subject in 1962. So since the light is modulated, intensity, the shift of the level is modulated in space. And because also the polarization is changing, the shift of the two spin up and spin down sublevels are not the same. So you have two uh, energy states in the ground state which are modulated in space and differently from one level to the other. So you have specially modulated light shifts of spin up and spin down due to the laser light. Also, because uh, of optical pumping, because the light is not too far from resonance, atoms can absorb light from one sublevel and go to the other level, which is what is called optical pumping. So you have also specially modulated optical pumping rates from G plus to G minus, or from G minus to G plus. So you achieve a situation where you have two specially modulated uh, energy levels for spin up and spin down, and optical pumping transition from one state to the other, 
And you can achieve a situation where the atom is moving in this direction. It's climbing a potential hill. And when it reaches the top of the hill, it has a large probability to be optically pumped in the other state. That is to see in the bottom of a valley. And then it climbs again, and pumping, and so on. So you see that the poor atom is exactly in the situation of the hero of the Greek mythology, Sisyphus, who was condemned, because he was condemned by the gods, to roll up a, a stone to the top of a mountain. And when he was at the top of the mountain, he was, the rock was put again in the bottom of the valley. And he has to do again and again the job. And that was exhausting for him. And the same thing occurs for the atom that slows down the atom. And in fact, you can make the theory of this effect. And it explains the experimental result. And you can show that you can cool atom in the micro Kelvin run, 10 to the minus 6 Kelvin run. Kelvin. To give you an order of magnitude, you know the physicists use the Kelvin unit for measuring the temperature, which goes from 0 to infinity. The boiling water is 370 degrees Kelvin. The freezing water is ice is 273 degrees Kelvin. In the room here, if it is 27 degrees Celsius, it would be 300 Kelvin. So we cool atom to. 10 to the minus 6, 300 million times uh, cooler than the room temperature. And in fact, we uh, uh, developed also other cooling schemes. We go to the nano Kelvin range, 10 to the minus 9 Kelvin. Now, let me tell you that there is another cooling scheme, which when you are already in the micro Kelvin range, which can be taking the following uh, path, and which allows you to go further down, and which is cooling by evaporation. And the idea is very simple. Suppose that you have a potential well with a depth u naught, and suppose you have two atoms in this potential well, and suppose they are undergoing collision, elastic collision. And consider two atoms with energy E1 and E2 undergoing an elastic collision. After the collision, because of the conservation of energy, uh, you will have two atoms with E3 and E4, and E1 plus E2 must be equal to E3 plus E4, that conservation of energy. If E4 is larger than U0, the atom with E4 leaves the potential well. It, it leaves. The remaining atom here has a very low energy, E3. And by collision with the other atom, you have a thermalization, and the whole sample cools down. So you lose atoms by evaporation, but the atoms which remain are cooler. It's, this is exactly what you do when you blow above your cup of tea or coffee to evacuate the hot molecule, and the remaining liquid gets cooler. That cool, cooling by evaporation, and very efficient, you, you reach the nano Kelvin. This is technique. So that's the scale of the temperature. I mentioned already uh, the freezing water, the boiling water. The, surf, the surface of the sun is about. Uh, 5,000 Kelvin, that 2.7 Kelvin is the cosmic bi microwave background radiation, the remnant of the Big Bang, and now Doppler cooling, polarization gradient cooling, Sisyphus cooling, evaporative cooling. So you see, you can see that the ultra cold quantum gases we know now how to produce in the lab are the coldest stuff in the universe. Now, how can you, now i would explain how you can control the velocity, how can you trap the atoms? The simplest idea is still to use the light shift and to focus tightly a laser beam, which is detuned to the red, to a low frequency. That's called optical tweezer, as was developed by uh, Ashkin and Stephen Chu. And you know, I told you that the shift is proportional to the light intensity. And if the detuning is to the red, the shift is negative. So when you cross the laser beam, the focus here you find an energy level which is going down and going up again. So you make a potential well. The focus of the beam is equivalent to a potential well in which atoms can be trapped if they are cold enough. And by moving the laser, you can move the atom. So you can trap the atom in the focus of the laser beam. And you can even do more. You can trap biological objects like viruses, bacteria, and that's called optical tweezers. OK, there is something which is uh, fascinating, that in, if instead of taking a single laser focused, if you, if you use a standing wave, as I mentioned before, you have minima and maxima of intensity. So you have a periodic array of potential well 
in which you can trap the atom. And if you can make a two-dimensional lattice, optical lattice like that, you can trap the atoms like that, exactly what you do when you have a box for eggs, a periodic set of uh, holes where you can put eggs. It's exactly the same idea, but now you, you trap atoms in this periodic potential. And you can do 1D, 2D, and 3D lattice, of course, with uh, you can atoms. Of course, there have been a lot of other traps which I have no time to discuss. Let me just, for the following of the, uh, part of the lecture, tell you how original are these optical lattices. You know, the motion of an atom in a periodic optical lattice shares many features with the dynamics of an electron in a solid state, which is moving in the periodic potential created by the ions. So it's a quite similar problem. But the optical lattices are much more easy to manipulate. You have many more possibilities. For example, you can switch off the laser beam, and you can switch off the lattice, which you cannot do in a, in a new crystal. You cannot switch off the ion potential. By changing the light intensity, you can change the, the depth of the potential well and control the tunnel effect between two adjacent wells. By changing the angle between the two lasers, you can change the spatial periodicity of the lattice. If you change the frequency of one of the laser beams, not the other one, you have a moving lattice. And you can choose the velocity as you want. You can change the dimensionality, and you can change the symmetry. You can make a triangular lattice, a square lattice, a cubic lattice. So optical lattices are a wonderful tool for uh, simulating what happens in a solid state. Furthermore, there is a fantastic possibility to control the atom-atom interaction by the Feldbach resonance, and would like to spend some time to explain what they are. What is a Feldbach resonance? Consider two atoms which are colliding with a very small energy E, and that the uh, molecular potential of the two atoms. So this is a channel a molecular channel, which I will call open because the initial state of the particle is a free state. It's not a bound state in this potential. And I take as a zero of energy the energy of the asymptote of this energy level here, potential. Now, the two atoms can exist in different spin configuration. So you have other channels, like this one, and this channel, I will call it closed, because uh, an, the, the pair of colliding atoms with energy E is not above the threshold here. So they, they, don't, they cannot have an open state with energy E. But this other channel, the, channel, the closed channel, may have a bound state, which I've represented here with an energy E bound. And it can happen that E bound, the energy of the bound state in this channel, is very close to the energy of the colliding state in the open channel. That's a situation which is interesting. Now, when you consider this problem of two channels, of course, the two channels are an approximation of the Hamiltonian. You neglect some terms in the Hamiltonian, which couples the two channels. That means that the incoming state of the two colliding atoms can be coupled by the neglected term to the bound state in the closed channel. That means that the two colliding atoms can make a virtual transition to the bound state and come back to the colliding state. They can feel what is going on in the bound state. And the duration of this virtual transition is each bar divided by the energy difference between the energy of the open state, of the free state, and the energy of the bound state. And if E bound is close to E, this virtual transition can last a very long time, and that can influence considerably the collision process. And at low temperature, all the collision process can be described by a single quantity, which is called the scattering length. And the scattering length can be dramatically changed by this resonant coupling. And there is a certain analogy between this resonant collision 
And what happens when you send a photon on an atom with an energy of the photon close to the energy of the optical transition? The photon can be absorbed and re-emitted with a very uh, long uh, virtual transition, and that can have modify considerably the scattering of the photon that is called resonance scattering. And what is wonderful is that the two channels correspond to two different spin configuration of the two, the two atoms. So they have not the same magnetic moment. And if you apply a static field, you can change the relative position of the two channels. You can do this, for example, you can move this channel and cross the resonance in one way or in the other way. So you have just a knob, which is a static field, where you can just change the energy difference between the open, the free state, and the bound state. So you can scan the resonance just by uh, changing the uh, static field. And this is the result of the calculation. If you plot the scattering length here versus the magnetic field, and if you call B0, the, field, the value of the field for which the colliding state and the bound state have the same energy, when you take into account the correction due to the shift, and that's the scattering length. And you can show that when the scattering length is positive, in this case here, the effective interaction between the atoms are repulsive. When the scattering length is negative here, the effective interaction between the atoms are attractive. And when the scattering length is zero here, you have no interaction, you have a perfect gap. So by changing the field, you can have a repulsive gas, an attractive gas, or a perfect gas. And in this region here, the scattering length is infinite, so the interaction is strong. So I have a strongly correlated system, a strongly interacting system, strongly correlation. So you see, you can control the interaction. And when you go a little further, you find that uh, the two-channel Hamiltonian, when you diagonalize this two-channel Hamiltonian, you find uh, you have a bound state. And in the, in the neighborhood of the resonance, in the region where the scattering length is larger than the range of the atom-atom interaction, in the region A negative, you have no bound state. In the region A positive, you have a bound state with an energy which is minus h bar squared divided by m e squared, A is the scattering length, and which is parabolic as a function of b minus b naught. So you see that in this region, you have no bound state, and in this region, you have a bound state and when you are in this region, the value of the binding energy, the value of the scattering length, are independent of the exact shape of the interatom interatomic potential. So you have an universal system, uni universal property. We no longer depend on the detail of the real interaction. So when you look at this picture, you see that you can easily, now you have a method for producing ultra-cold molecules for ultra-cold atoms. Suppose and these molecules are called Feshbach molecules. Suppose that you sweep slowly the, the magnetic field from the region A negative to the region A positive. And suppose you start with a pair of colliding atoms, and you move the field. So this system will follow and will form a bound state when you are here. So you see that by sweeping a magnetic field from the region A negative to the region A positive, you can transform a pair of ultra-cold atoms into a molecule. And that's a very interesting way of producing molecules. Now also, let me tell you that you have also, it has been shown that you have also the possibility in this region to form three atoms. When three atoms are colliding, you can form a trimer which is called Efimov, a molecule, a trimer state, which have been observed recently by Rudy Grimm in Innsbruck. And that's also a very beautiful illustration of ultra cold atoms. You have also another method for producing ultra cold molecules. The molecule is to glue the two atoms with a photon. What you do, you, you, have, you start with two atoms here, 
in a colliding state. And by uh, absorbing a photon, you can put them in a bound state of another molecular potential, A plus A star. That called one photon photo association. And you can also use a Raman process with two color lasers and start from here and produce atoms in this bound state in the same molecular potential, two color photo, photo association. And in Paris, we have recently applied this method to collision between two metastable helium atoms having each an energy of 20 electron volts above the ground state. And we have produced quite exotic molecules in this state, we have produced molecules, giant dimers, with a distance between the two atoms larger than 50 nanometers, which is quite unusual for molecules. Usually, it's a, a few angstrom, the distance between the two atoms in the molecule. Here, it's 500 times bigger. And when you calculate the energy levels of this molecule, you have to take into account in the van der Waals interaction the retardation, because the distance between the two atoms is very large. And we have also produced metastable molecules in this state. And we have been able to measure the binding energy of this level with a very great accuracy and deduce the scattering length of two metastable helium atoms with an accuracy about 100 times larger than all previous measurements. So you see that uh, you can play with ultra-cold atoms. You can combine them in dimer, trimers, and very efficiently, either by Feigenbach resonance or by uh, photon. So let me now uh, consider uh, one great class of application of ultra cold atom, which is test of fundamental laws. And first, let me discuss uh, ultra precise atomic clocks. You know, uh, all time measurements are based on periodic phenomena. We, the quartz we have in our watch use the vibration of the quartz. But if you take two quartz, they have not the same frequency, and the frequency of a quartz can change in time. So they are not universal oscillators. The good thing is to use as a universal frequency the frequency of an atom, of an atomic transition, because all atoms in the universe are the same, are identical. So the scheme of an atomic clock is the following one. You start with an ordinary oscillator, a quartz oscillator. You generate an electromagnetic wave, and you scan the frequency of a transition between two sublevels of the cesium atom, which are taken as the definition of the second, international definition of the second. And you know this resonance is centered on the atomic frequency, omega a, and as a certain width, delta omega. And with the servo loop, you lock the frequency of the oscillator so that it remains at the center of the atomic line. So this is what is called an atomic clock. When you look at this picture, you see that the smaller the narrower the resonance, the smaller delta omega, the better the locking. So to have a precise clock, you have to make delta omega as small as possible. But in quantum mechanics, the time uncertainty, time frequency uncertainty relation tells you that delta omega is inversely proportional to the observation time, capital T. So to have a small delta omega, you need to have large, long observation time. Ultra cold atoms move very slowly, one millimeter per second, one centimeter per second, compared to thermal atoms, which go to 300 meters per second. So you can observe them for a long time, having a very narrow resonance and very precise clock. That, that's why ultra cold atoms <coughs> are important <coughs> for the measurement of time. So, how you build an atom, an atomic clock? Usually, what is done in the usual clock is to take an atomic beam of cesium, let me take a, a velocity 100 meters per second, and it crosses two cavities, microwave cavities, which induce a resonant frequency of the cesium atoms with a length small l separated by a length total n 0.5 meter. You know, and that uh, the idea of using two separate cavities was uh, put forward by Norman Ramsey and you know what happened is the following one. If you have a single cavity, the observation time is the crossing time through the cavity, which is small l divided by v. But if you have two cavities fed by the same microwave, if the two fields are coherent into two cavities, Norman Ramsey showed that then you expect to see in the resonance probability, transition probability, fringes 
which are called Ramsey fringes, and with width, which is now the transit time between the two cavities. So instead of having the crossing time of a single cavity, now we have a much longer time, which is the time between the two cavities. You know, this is quite similar to the young fridge in optics. When you have two slits and you make interference experiment, a single slit gives you a diffraction profile, which is determined by the width of the slit. But if you have two slits, you have interference fringe inside the diffraction profile, whose separation is determined by the distance between the two slits. It's exactly the same idea, the same idea which is based on the Fourier transform. Now, how can you do that with ultra cold atoms? If you slow down a beam like that, the beam will fall due to gravity. So instead of taking an horizontal beam, what you do is to take a vertical beam. You throw the atom up like that, and the atom are thrown again uh, uh, up by a laser pulse, and they cross the cavity once on the way up and once on the way down. So you have two pulses, but the same atom passing the cavity once on the way up and once on the way down. If you call that call a fountain, because it looks like a fountain of water, we have a molecule of water which has pushed up and go up and down. Fountain of atoms. And if you call capital H the height of the fountain, and if you start the time it takes between the passing of the cavity in the way up and the passing of the cavity in the way down, is given by a high school formula, GT over two squared divided by two equals H, and when you put the number, you find T equal 0 0.5 second. Compared to, if you take it here, 0 0.5 meter and 100 meter per second, you get five milliseconds. Here you have 500 milliseconds, so you increase the time between the two pulses by a factor 100, 100. So the, the clock will be 100 times more precise. And these fountains have been achieved for sodium, for cesium, and in Paris, for cesium, they have been uh, uh, developed by my two colleagues, Christophe Salomon and André Clairon, and uh, that's an example of the Ramsey fringes, which are obtained, very good signal to noise ratio. And uh, the performance of the clock are the following one. You have the stability, relative stability, and accuracy of a few 10 to the minus 16. That, wh what does that mean? A clock with an accuracy of 10 to the minus 16. That means if you have such a clock starting now, 300 million years after, it will be wrong by less than one second. So one second over 300 million years. So that shows you an idea of the accuracy of the clock. Now, of course, physicists are never happy. They want to always to improve. And of course, you cannot make fountain higher and higher because the time increases only at the square root of the height. So it's better to get rid of gravity, to go to space. And uh, uh, when, when you work in microgravity, you avoid the fall of atoms. If you throw the atom with a small velocity, they will cross the two cavity without falling and you can have a very long lifetime. And in, in France, there have been a campaign using the so-called zero-G flight Airbus of the CNES, Centre National d'Etudes Spatiales. So the pilot put the plane in like that, 45 degrees. He switched off the engine, so the flight continues, make a parabola, and goes down, and before it crash, he put the engine again, and second parabola, and during the parabola, which lasts about 20 seconds, you have no gravity. The gravity is reduced, and you can make experiments. And in the, in the plane, you have physicists, chemists, biologists, industrial people doing microgravity experiments. And that shows you a picture of the group. I was not allowed to do that because I'm too old, but uh, my, my colleagues went there uh, in the normal phase and in the, in the parabola, yeah. uh, floating in space. And the experiment worked very well, and uh, the laser can be locked, uh, and the measurement can be done. In fact, 10 improvement has been obtained in the measurement of time. And now, after a lot of, that gives you just a sensitivity gain. That the Ramsey fringe with the thermal beam, with the width 100 Hertz here. When you go to the fountain, 
if you increase it by 14, that's the Ramsey frame, and you get a factor 100 beta. And if you get in this uh, micro FARAO is an acronym for Projet d'horloge atomique par ralentissement d'atomes en orbite. Uh, atomic clock by slowing down atoms in orbit. And now uh, you get a factor of 10 more. So you go from 100 Hertz to 1.1 Hertz. Factor three orders of magnitude improvement. And now it has been just a few months ago, after a series of problems, uh, the French National Space Agency, CNES, and the European Space Agency have agreed to put this clock in the International Space Station. Yeah with a hydrogen measure. And you know, uh, Christophe Salomon is the PI of this project, a principal investigator. And if it, the flight will take place prob probably in 12, uh, 2013, 2013, And if the clock works, do we have a clock delivering time to all clocks in the world, in, in Earth, in the satellite of the GPS system, of the Galileo system, allowing the synchronization of this clock with this accuracy. That would be extremely important for the GPS system. And of course, we will have a possibility to make tests of fundamental uh, law, like general relativity and a lot of application. Let me give you an example of application to basic physics. Uh, Einstein uh, uh, theory of general relativity predicts that if you have two clocks in the Earth gravitational field separated by a distance delta z, the relative variation of the clock frequency, delta omega over omega, is equal to g, the, gravity, the acceleration due to gravity, delta z over c squared. If you take one meter, two clocks separated by one meter height, you find that delta omega over omega is equal to 10 minus 16. So we are now in the sensitivity range, allowing you to see if two clocks are in different of altitude of one meter. If you have a clock in the satellite, in the space station, 400 kilometer in clock in space, in Earth, the variation of frequency, relative frequency change, will be 4, 10 minus 11. So it will be possible, in fact, to t test that that uh, figure is wrong. It's 70, uh, 70, 70. It will be uh, possible to test general relativity with an accuracy nearly 200 of magnitude better than all previous measurements. So you see that how, uh, by improving the accuracy, you can really perform very refined tests of general relativity. Another application, which is unexpected, you can determine in this way the surface around the Earth where the gravitational potential is, has a certain value, which is called the geoid. And that could give you some information about the inner structure of the Earth. So, so that could have application in Earth sciences. You know, this, you know, this picture is impressive because it gives the relative accuracy of the clock versus time from 1950 to now. And the black dots here are the microwave clocks, the cesium clocks. Here, the redefinition of the second from the cesium atom in 1965. And you see the improvement of the cesium clock. And the cold atom clocks are here. And in red, you see the optical clocks. The clocks using not a microwave transition, but an optical transition. So the new, the new, the frequency of the transition is much higher for optical than for microwave. And if delta nu is the same, the Q factor of the resonance is much higher for optical clocks but much more difficult to operate. But now the progress are dramatic. And you see that now the, the optical clocks are becoming the best. Of course, they are too complicated to, to be put in space for the moment, but perhaps within 10 to 20 years. So now the optical clocks, in particular the clocks achieved in Nice Boulder by the group of Dave Wineland and Jim Verquist, reached 9, 10 minus 17, which means that now you can detect if two clocks are separated by a difference of altitude of 10 centimeters. And if you take uh, two different atoms, and if you make the ratio of the frequency of the two atoms, and if you, if you follow this ratio for several years, 
since the ratio of the two frequencies depends on fundamental constants, like the fine structure constant, like the magnetic moment of the, of the proton, you can test if the fundamental constants are changing in time in the cosmological scale. And that the recent result obtained by the NIST Boulder group, which compared uh, the ratio between the two frequencies of aluminum plus and mercury plus, and the ratio measured with 7, 10 minus 17 digit. And they have been able to show that alpha prime over alpha, the, the, the variation of the fine structure constant, relative variation, is given by this, for this expression, 10 minus 17 per year. And that gives you this error bar. If you combine this with other measurements performed on hyperfine structure, which depend also on the magnetic moment, so that you have some error bars here, you find, when you combine all these measurements, you find these uh, cycles here, which at the moment does not indicate any variation of the fundamental constant. But if the increase still increases, one can hope to see, for example, if alpha change in time or not. That would be a major discovery if it is found. So you see that first example, how by making a very precise measurement with ultra-cold atoms or ultra-cold ions, you can improve the precision of the test, which you can perform basic physical law. So let me now think, take the last part of my talk. How can you go from ultra-cold atoms to more and more complex systems? And that the present trend of the field. Of course, you can make both Einstein condensate, uh, quantum degenerate gases. You can study phase transition involving bosonic atoms or molecules, like the superfluid mode insulator transition, the BEC-BCS crossover from a molecular BEC to a bardeen cooper schrieffer superfluid phase of Cooper pair of fermionic atoms. How you can study the berezinsky kosciuszko tauler transition for two-dimensional two gases. You can also now study the same thing for fermionic atoms and study the metal mode insulator transition, the toward antiferromagnetic structure. You know, what is wonderful with atoms is, as you know, if you consider the atom as an entity, which is not broken during a collision, you know that in physics you have two types of particles, bosons and fermions, and an atom is a boson if, if it has an all even number of protons, neutrons, electrons. For example, hydrogen is a boson, one proton, one electron. An atom is a fermion. It is, has an odd number of protons, neutrons, electrons. For example, the tyrium is a fermion because it has one proton, one neutron, one electron. Lithium-6 is a fermion, whereas lithium-7 is a boson. So depending on the isotope, you have the two types of statistics, the fermionic and bosonic. And since the light frequency, the resonance frequency are not the same because of the isotope shift, you can play, you can detect, cool separately the bosonic and the fermionic species in the mixture. So you have a very nice uh, possibility to study the effect of statistics. So, and finally, of course, you can use ultra cold atoms as quantum simulators. So let me say just a few words about this. Of course, both Einstein condensation presented in very simple terms. When you decrease the temperature of a gas, at high temperatures, the De Broglie wavelength, which is inversely proportional to the velocity, is very small. So the wave packets are point-like, and the atoms behave as classical objects. When you lower the temperature, the wave packet becomes larger, but they are still uh, separate. And at a certain temperature, the wave packet overlap they interfere, and because of this quantum interference, you can show that so it was shown by Einstein for the first time in 1924, they go to the ground state of the trap which contains the gas. And if you decrease the gain, you will have all atoms in the ground state of the trap. And you know, then when you are in this state, all atoms are in the same wave function. You have a wave function, a three-dimensional wave function, which is occupied by a macroscopic number of atoms, by a million of atoms. And you know, I like this picture published by the Science Magazine, where they compare a Bose-Einstein condensate 
where all atoms are coherent at the same phase with an army of soldiers marching in lockstep. And you, need, you see, the, these soldiers here are the atoms we are not yet condensed. In the same way as in the gas, you have also some atoms in the gas we are not yet in the condensate. So, you know, uh, this uh, condensate was discovered in 1995. Uh, let me show you uh, this famous picture of the, obtained by, at the Boulder by the Gila group of Cornell and Weyman, uh, Eric Cornell and Carl Weyman, and it is the MIT group of Wolfgang Ketterle on the sodium-23. You know, these objects are macroscopic quantum system. They have size of the order of a few tenths of microns, 10, 20, uh, 50 microns, all atoms in the same wave function. You can even see them by eye with the mic uh, microscope. So they are macroscopic objects which exhibit uh, properties, quantum macroscopic properties like superfluidity currents, which makes them similar to other systems which up to now have were observed only in liquids or solids, like superfluid helium or superconductors. Now they are observed in gases which are orders of magnitude more dilute than this system, and where atom-atom interaction can be more easily controlled and understood. And many atoms now have been condensed. Let me just a, a, a short uh, snapshot showing a few examples of this quantum property. Coherence, you have two condensate, you let them fall, expand, overlap, and they interfere, giving you splendid interference ranges like two wave of two light waves that was observed at MIT. Uh, atom laser, if you have a, a condensate, and if you make a small hole in the trap, you have a beam of matter wave coming out. It's the same way as in a laser, you have a cavity containing a microscopic number of photons, and one of the mirror is not perfect, and you have a current beam of light going uh, in this way. So this is called an atom laser. It looks like a laser, except that the optical waves are replaced by atomic de Broglie waves. Superfluidity, when you try to rotate a condensate, it does not rotate like a classical body. It rotates with a velocity field, which is the uh, circulation with quantized, quantization of the circulation of the velocity, which is called a quantized vortex. And you see here a, a lattice of vortices observed in ENS by Jean Dalibar. Also in MIT, in the group of old Ketterle. And you, when you look at this picture, and when you compare them with the lat, uh, lattice of quantized vortices which were observed in superconductor, you see they are quite similar. Uh, so that's called abrigos of lattice. So you see you have similar structure in a gas, ultra cold gas, and in a superconductor. So that let me, lead, leads me to a study of a few. Uh, <coughs> phase transition, and one wonderful experiment which was achieved by the group of Emmanuel Bloch a few years ago was the superfluid mode insulator transition. And it can be explained very qualitatively in the following way. Suppose you have an optical lattice like that. And suppose that the height of the potential barrier here is low enough to allow tunnel effect through the potential wave. So the atomic wave, matter wave, will be able to expand along the whole lattice. And when you condense the system, they will be all in the lowest block state of the lattice. So you, you will have a macroscopic matter wave extending the whole lattice in forming a superfluid phase, a delocalized matter wave. But it's easy to increase the laser intensity to increase the height of the potential well in such a way that now the tunnel effect cannot be, take place. Is freeze frozen. And then the atoms are, remain localized in each potential well. And this matter well and this matter well are no longer coherent. And how can you detect the effect? You switch off the lattice and you see how this wave and this wave it will interfere in two cases. In the first case, they are coherent, they interfere, and they give you a superb Bragg diffraction profile coming from this diffraction of this periodic structure. In this case, you have only the diffraction to the single wave function here, you have broad structure. And to if, when you increase the intensity of the laser, you go continuously from this to this, 
And if you decrease, you come back. The transition is reversible. So this is a beautiful example of realization of the so-called bold Hubbard Hamiltonian. And that, ex that experimental result. Huh? OK. Uh, another very nice thing is the BC, EBC BCS crossover. Suppose that you take a fish bar resonance and you explore the region A positive, A negative, A infinite around a fish bar resonance. In the region A positive, you remember that I told you that there is a bound state where the two atoms interact strongly in the bound state. So you have a real molecule. So if you make this experiment with fermionic atoms, not bosonic, fermionic atoms, the lifetime of these molecules is long, much longer than if the two atoms are bosonic. And why? It's a beautiful illustration of Pauli principle. If the molecule is formed by two fermionic atoms in two different spin states, this molecule cannot, the collision with other atoms is inhibited by the Pauli principle because if the molecules, in the molecules, the two spins are like that, if you have any, any other atom, it will have always a spin parallel to one of the two atoms. So because of Pauli principle, it couldn't approach too much and the stability of the molecule will be higher. I am simplifying the system, but there is the basic idea. So the lifetime of the molecule is large enough, and the, you can produce molecules in such a great number that they condense. And you have a condensate of bosonic f molecules formed by two fermionic atoms. Because when you have two fermionic atoms, you have a bosonic system. In the region A negative, you have no bound state of the two-channel Hamiltonian, but you have a weak attractive interaction because A is negative. And in a many-body system, it has been shown by Cooper when you have a weak interaction between two fermions, they can form a Cooper pair with a very large extension. And this, this is when these Cooper pairs are bosons, and when they condense, they form the superfluid phase, which is responsible for the absence of resistance in the superconductor. And the same thing can happen with two uh, fermionic at two bosonic atoms. Uh, excuse me, two fermionic atoms which form a, a Cooper pair. And in the region A infinite, is the center of the resonance, you have a very strong interaction because A is infinite, and you have a very strongly correlated system. So by changing the value of the magnetic field, you can cross the phase bar resonance, and you can go continuously from the BEC phase to the BCS phase. And the, what was the great question in condensed matter, how something happened during this transition? And the answer has been obtained by, by the von Gunkettale group at MIT. They have shown that you can observe vortices in the three phase, three domain, showing you that the, you have the three phase, the three superfluid phase, that the lattice of vortices for A positive, A negative, and infinite. So this transition has been studied and a lot of interesting experiments are being done now by making imbalance of opposition between the two spin sets and so on. Another example with bosons is the BK, BKT, Berezinski, Kosterlis, Taoles transition crossover in a trapped two-dimensional Bose gas. How can you make a, a dimensional, two-dimensional Bose gas? You take only two laser beams forming a plain standing wave. So you have some pancake here, the condensate is from pancake. And if you take only two planes, you have two pancake, two condensate, two uh, two-dimensional system like that. And that the lattice, the, the laser beam forming the lattice. And by putting a laser beam in this direction, you can, and by switching off the lattice, the two pancake expand, they interfere, and you can look at the interference between the two overlapping two-dimensional systems. And this is what you observe. At low temperature, you see beautiful fringes, which shows you that the two, the two waves here are coherent and they interfere. And when you increase the temperature, you start to see waving structures. That means the current is lost, start to be lost. And in fact, uh, the Kostelis-Tauris-Berezinski transition says that 
in, in this phase, in the superfluid phase, you, you have a long range order due to the fact that you have pairs of vortex, anti-vortex pairs, which do not prevent superfluidity. So the superfluid phase is interpreted in this theory as the existence of vortex, anti-vortex pairs. And when you go through the transition, these pairs are broken and you have three vortices, either in this direction or in the other direction. And this is what is observed in the experiment for the first time in the ultra cold gas. What you see, you see structure like that. Instead of looking at this fringe, you see dislocation like that. And that's easy to understand because if you have in the lower plane no vortex, but in the upper plane a vortex, a vortex like that, the phase varies from zero to pi here. So you have a constructive interference here, a destructive interference here, and this is why you have this uh, discontinuity in the interference fringes. So it has been shown experimentally by the group of uh, Jean Dalibar in Paris that the onset of sharp dislocation coincides with the loss of long range order. So that proves that the BKT crossover is due to the unbinding of vortex anti vortex pairs. That's also a very interesting uh, demonstration of the 2D system. Just, let me just give you a last example with fermionic atoms now, thermionic MOS insulator transition, and which has been obtained only a few months ago by two groups, in, uh, the group of uh, Emmanuel Bloch in Mainz and the group of Tim Eslinger in Zurich. And let me explain, it can be explained uh, very simply. Suppose that you have a lattice and you put in this lattice a mixture of two fermionic atoms in two different spin states. Speed up red here and spin down blue. And so the atoms go in the potential well, like the eggs of the box. And suppose that you add to the lattice an harmonic potential well, which push the atom towards the center. So it's equivalent to making a pressure on the lattice, to make a confinement. So question, how are the atoms moving in this lattice? Under the effect? of the confinement on the potential well on the atom-atom interaction. And suppose that you choose the flash bar resonance in such a way that the atoms repel each other. So you have a competition between several effects. Pauli exclusion principle prevents two atoms with the same color to be in the same well. Because two fermionic atoms cannot be identical, cannot be in the same quantum state. If you have strong repulsing potential, two different spin state atoms cannot be in the same potential well because they repel each other. It costs energy. And also, external confinement pulls the atom towards the center of the lattice. How? The balance between these effects. And this is exactly what you do with the Fermi Hubbard Hamiltonian. And you can make, uh, that's a reference of the picture, and you can make a very simple. Uh, picture for understanding what happened. Let me uh, suppose take a single bond model. And suppose first that the atoms are not interacting. When, when you have not, the potential here is weak, the confinement potential is weak, you have atoms, single atom or pair atoms with different spin states. But you need, they can move. So you have a metal, a metal which is compressible. And when you increase the pressure, then the atom go to the center. And you end up with a system where you have, in each well, two atoms in two different spin states. You have a bond insulator. The bond is filled. Suppose now the atom is attracting, uh, are interacting with repulsive interaction. At the beginning, you have, you have only one atom per side. You have you cannot have two atoms in the spin state and two atoms in different spin state repel each other. So you have things like that, but you have few at, you should, they are scattered on the lattice. They move, you have a compressible metal. And then you increase the pressure by moving like that. And then you achieve a situation where all wells are occupied by, by a single atom which can be either spin up and spin down. This is exactly what is called a MOT insulator. The atom can no longer move. You have a MOT, a MOT insulator where the, the 
occupation of each uh, well is one half because you have only one particle. And if you increase more uh, the pressure, you end up by filling the band and you have a band insulator. So you go from here to here by first a mort insulator and then a band insulator. And that has been observed experimentally when you increase the potential here, the cloud size, which is measured by time of flight, decreases at the beginning, you, make, you compress the system, you get a plateau, which is the mode insulator, and the second plateau, which is the band insulator. So it's a, it's a beautiful experiment showing you how you can achieve this situation and study in, in detail this transition. You can also, of course, try to put, to make a quantum magnetism with such a system. The problem is how to achieve an interaction alpha si dot sg between two spins. There are many ways. You can take atoms with a large magnetic dipole. You can make heteropolar molecules in the ground state. That has been achieved. And you can also what, use what is called super exchange, which use the combination of Pauli principle and on-site interaction. And you need to have a very, very low temperature. KVT must be lower than the constant alpha, which is already very small. So that's a big challenge. You have to make an interaction, an exchange interaction between two, two atoms and have a very low temperature, KBT smaller than alpha. If you have a square lattice, the most favorable transition would be an antiferromagnetic structure that's not yet beginning to be observed. You can also make, but with the trees of beam, a triangular lattice, and that's also very interesting because in triangular lattice, of course, if you put the atom in a spin state here, the other one must be in the, lower, uh, the other state. But when you have to put the third one here, can you put plus or minus? That's what is called frustration. You have some uh, difficulty to achieve an antiferromagnetic structure <laughs> with a triangular lattice. So you see that's an example of problem which hopefully could be studied. So la that uh, leads me to my conclusion. I think uh, the trend of the field now is the following one, is to consider ultra-cold atoms as a quantum simulator. It, the idea is to achieve an experimental system whose behavior reproduces as close as possible a certain class of Hamiltonian, the bose about the fermi about and so on. And that was an idea of Feynman. When you have a problem which is too difficult to solve theoretically, because you cannot diagonalize the Hamiltonian, even with the best computer. You have to find a system, an experimental system, which is governed by this Hamiltonian, and to make the experiment and to get the answer. And the requirement for a quantum simulator is to be able to tailor the potential with the particles are moving, to control the interaction between the particles, to control the temperature, the density, and to be able to measure various properties of the system. And all these requirements are more or less achieved by ultra-cold atoms because, of course, you can have many flexible, uh, flexible potential of any dimensionality, single well, periodic potential well, and so on. You can control the interaction with fresh bar resonance and by time of flight technique, by uh, imaging, you can determine all the properties of the system. So you can hope in this way to answer questions which are unreachable by classical computers, present computers, because of lack of memory and size of computer. So this is, I think, uh, one exciting thing, which is also very interesting, because that increased the dialogue between different communities. Now, in the seminar, uh, you have uh, atomic AMO people, atomic molecular and optical physics people talking with uh, people from condensed matter, from solid state physics, talk, talking with condensed uh, statistical physicists. And that's a very nice evolution, showing the unity of physics. Thank you very much for your attention. All right, well, thank you for the, that was a wonderful lecture. So questions? Well, this is a beautiful discussion of uh, demonstrations of uh, fantastic physics. Uh, now, I would like to ask you, however, 
Um, you think we'll prove anything completely new or discover some errors in physics. You, uh, and otherwise, what are the most important applications you think these phenomena will show us? You know, practical application. Practical application. You know, uh, I've already mentioned the atomic clocks, which are useful for GPS system, for synchronizing uh, the circulation of communication in the network, for internet, for high speed uh, communication. There's also another important application which I didn't mention here because it used very dilute ultra cold systems, atomic gas system, which is interferometry. Because you know, the, you can repeat with atomic de Broglie waves all the experiments done with optical waves. You can make gyrometers, radiometers, and uh, here in particular in Berkeley, the group of Dan Stamperker is doing some uh, interferometry experiment. So, atomic de Broglie waves in the interferometric device offer opportunities which are much more promising than optical waves in the similar interferometers. And that, that's a, a way of, could, could give rise to a lot of applications. For, for example, measuring the gravity field with the high precision, as shown by Stephen Chu and Mark Kazevich some, some years ago, measuring the rotation speed and uh, measuring some topological phase. So that could have a, a lot of application. And in the same way as the laser revolutionized the optics, we, we can hope also that atom lasers could also revolutionize uh, atom, atom optics and provide to some interesting application. And of course, uh, one longer term application is quantum information. Because uh, cold atoms, cold ions are ideal system for entanglement and for realizing quantum gates, which are the basic tool of quantum information. That still has to be, uh, you have to improve the system quite a lot before reaching a quantum computer. Quantum computer has I believe very far apart. But I think uh, cold atoms are a very promising system for going along this direction. You know, just, just to uh, add something remark, you know, the, the application of laser have been dramatically enhanced when it has been possible to miniaturize the system, to make compact device, solid state device, like this one, uh, you know, very, very convenient. No, now a lot of people are working on miniaturization of atomic experiment with cold atoms by doing cold atom chips, making the experiment on a chip, making both Einstein conversation on a chip. And also the technology in this direction is improving day after day. And it could happen that within a few years there will be practical application, gyrometer on the small chips, and perhaps in the planes, the laser gyro will be replaced by atom gyros, atomic laser gyros. One of the longest and yet still unresolved problem in uh, condensed metaphysics is trying to understand the properties of glass. Yeah. So glass is an amorphous material, so I wonder if it would be possible to create an amorphous optical lattice to study this yes, problem. Of course, that, that's a very interesting question. I didn't have time to, to talk about it. But you know, recently, there have been several groups, including a group in, in Orsi by uh, Alain Spee, another group in, in Italy, where you try to observe Anderson localization of matter waves. You know, in this case, you have not to make a, you, you have to, you study the localization of matter waves in an optical potential. Of course, if you make a periodic potential, an optical lattice, it's a regular lattice and you cannot observe localization. The way of doing it is to make a speckle. To make a speckle of light, so you have a random optical potential and you are looking at the matter wave in this random potential and localization has been observed. So the equivalent of amorphous system, uh, amorphous potential, is produced by using 
speckle, uh, uh, random uh, array of light intensity. Any other questions? Well, I think we should, oh, way back there. Can you shout or do you want a mic? Yeah. No, please, come, come down. <laughs> OK, my question is just, do you think there's anything genuinely unknown in atomic physics and molecular physics? An open question, maybe an experiment that really contradicts theory, or the theory as far as it is known. Who knows? <laughs> 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 you know, uh, you know, my experience with atomic physics is from I work in this field for more than 50 years, and I very often listen to people saying that atomic physics is finished, everything is known, no surprise. And then the laser came with all the revolution introduced by the laser, and then uh, high intensity laser, the multiphoton physics, uh, attosecond physics. Uh, now cold atoms, now quantum information. So I am very careful. You know, uh, the most interesting thing when, when you when you ask a group of people to make predictions, to write some ball of crystal, what will happen in the next ten years? Okay, it's a good exercise because you think about your field, but most generally you don't predict the important problem. The important discovery are not predictable. So this is what is nice in, in research. You have a good surprise. So I hope we have still good surprise. But I cannot tell you because that reminds me that I was in, once involved in such a report. We spent a group of 10 physicists spending uh, six months writing a report for the president. I, don't, I will not name the president. When we, when we gave him the report, he said, oh, we have made a good work. But I'm a little disappointed. I was expecting a calendar. The fusion will be solved at this year. The, <laughs> this problem will be solved here. The cancer problem will be solved in this problem. Too. It's incredible. We, uh, Jacques Friedel, who was uh, chairing the committee, said, if we know uh, the, uh, when the fusion will be solved, we'll do it now. <laughs> we cannot say that. OK, Marvin, do you want to, do you want to say anything, Marvin, to, to wrap things up? And... Thank you for a wonderful lecture. <laughs>